mistake again. Hi, everybody. This is Cindy Kennedy from Living With Lyme, and uh, you are listening to yet another podcast. We are really rolling with a podcast every week. We encourage you to come back soon and subscribe to the website, www.livingwithlyme.us. We're real excited today because we're going to talk a lot about women and we're going to talk a lot about mold. And we have Dr. Ann Shippey with us today. And she comes to us from Texas. Although when I spoke to her before, she didn't have a drawl. So if she says y'all, she's talking about everybody. So we're real excited. She's going to tell us about her previous career and what she's doing now and she's got a wonderfully thriving practice and we're really excited to have her she is a very highly educated lady she is an author she's a researcher she works with uh, people uh, to get root cause reasons for their illness and she does work um, with genetics as well and that's a big interest of mine is so I, I know I've talked to you all about it. So I'm boring you terribly. So let's introduce Dr. Shippey. Hi, Dr. Ann. How are you? Thanks for having me. I'm excited to get to share with you today. I'm real excited because you have a lot of information. And um, let's, let's just dig in. I want to hear about you. Tell everyone you know, from the moment of birth, okay? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've had um, quite a journey with uh, learning about medicine for, through my own body. I was a chemical engineer for IBM for almost 10 years, and towards the end of that, got very sick. And I was going from doctor to doctor, and nobody could explain to me why I was fine before I went on my vacation and I came home and I was never the same again. So um, I had to take it into my own hands. It was before the internet. It was, the internet was really just getting started. So I, I started look, uh, looking at all the books that I, reading all the books that I could that might give me some clues and um, was sort of thinking outside the box. I went to a naturopath and I went to an acupuncturist, an herbalist, a nutritionist. <laughs> um, I, I drove a couple hours to a very outside the box uh, allergist that found out that I had a bit of an immunodeficiency going on. And finally, with all these pieces of the puzzles, uh, dramatically changing my diet and getting my body uh, restored again, I woke up one morning and decided to go to medical school. So I was like, oh my gosh, we need to do medicine differently. This, <laughs> this is more how we should be, where we're really helping the body to restore rather than just band-aiding the symptoms with medicines. That's, um, that's really cool. That's really cool. And it's kind of like, I think it's a divine intervention. Some of us that get sick and then move on to do a different type of treatment <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, yeah, we've been in the shoes. So I think uh, the patients relate to us a lot easier knowing our history. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I loved working for IBM and I got to do really cool things like lead teams uh, across organizations and even outside of IBM to get rid of the, some of the toxic chemicals that we had in our manufacturing processes. And it was really, really rewarding. But what I get to do now, or I get to use my engineering brain to, <laughs> to gather data and you know figure out for each individual person what's going to help their body uh, recover is just so fun. <laughs> I know, really... and you're well ahead of the curve by having that type of background, and uh, it really, it does change the way you think. So that being said, um, your practice is you know, you are an allopathic physician turned or you don't really necessarily turn because you bring that with you yeah. and then you really see a different approach. I'm so happy because at that pivotal point where I decided to go back to medical school, I was considering all my options. You know, do I want to uh, do oriental medicine? Do I just want to go get a PhD in nutrition? Um, you know, what what do I need as a foundation to be able to do what I wanted to do? And I, their functional medicine was not on the map yet. And, but I just knew I needed that um, in-depth training of the MD to help me to have the credibility uh, to do the type of medicine that I wanted to do. And there are times that I, 
I mean, I use my MD background every day with some of the testing that I do, um, you know, being able to prescribe medications. There is a time and a place where, where I want to use medications. I'll avoid them as much as I can, but when it's appropriate, yeah, I'm very, very grateful for that structure. And then um, I had a baby in med school and a baby in residency <laughs> in my 30s. <laughs> Thank God I got those wonderful babies, but it was uh, a little bit much for my body. So when I got finished with my residency, I, I didn't know where to go next to get that additional training at, because again, functional medicine wasn't on the map. And um, so I went into standard internal medicine practice where you're seeing 20 patients a day, you know, within a few minutes, what prescription you're going to write. Um, and you know, if I didn't, I was always writing behind my poor, um, office manager. So I was like, oh, get going. Um, but I got sick again. Uh, I developed a couple of autoimmune disorders, Sjogren's, and then, uh, anti-cardiolipin antibodies, which increase your risk for, uh, stroke and uh, that kind of thing. So fortunately, that was right when functional medicine was starting to have a little bit of a presence. So the first functional medicine training that I went to was in Gig Harbor, Washington. They offered it twice a year in a little hotel conference room with, I think, about 40 people. <laughs> now it's all over the world and they're at the major conference. There's, uh, I think, a couple thousand at this last... Uh, um, yeah, at this last one. So where were you? What, which one did you recently go to? The one. Oh, the one in uh, San Antonio. Oh, um, okay. Yeah, yeah. I okay. only made it to a, a portion of it, but it was very well. Uh, you know, well attended. These these conferences, uh, the terminology, and the in depth things for for some people, it's kind of like drinking from a fire hose. So you're, you're better off to take some pearls and then go back and use them and then go back to another conference and learn a little bit more. Yeah. So I, I mean, I've been going to these conferences for so long and I'd love to learn. So well, when I, it when I like go, it. most of it is stuff I already know. And then there are the little pearls that I can, can add in to take home to up my game a little bit even more. Now with your chemical background, your engineering background, um, you know, you, you got a taste of our environment and what's wrong with it. And it's, it's apparent these days that we have a big problem. And how are you using that data, that information and bringing it into your practice to help your patients? Yeah. So that's one of the big things that I teach is that we, we think a little bit won't hurt us, but toxins are actually cumulative. So we're getting a little bit from our food packaging containers, even the plastic water bottles that we're grabbing and drinking out of. It's in our skincare and hair care, the artificial nails. Like that doesn't make any sense to put, expose yourself to those. Um, it's in the things that outgas in our home, the cabinetry, the floors, the carpeting, the mattresses, and it's in our food. Um, all the pesticides, herbicides. And I have the, I'm so fortunate that I get this window into the world because my patients are either, they have the financial ability to, to do tests that insurance isn't covered for, or they're just really prioritizing their resources because they're so sick that, you know, they're, like, they're going to do without a vacation or do without that new couch. You know, they're just really, really prioritizing their health. So I have the unique opportunity uh, to really ha be able to look at data and get a sense of what people are getting exposed to. Um, at, you know, and people come from all over the country, sometimes even outside of the country. So there are definitely some really um, significant themes with um, like anybody that I'm seeing that's not really trying to eat mostly organic, we're seeing very high glyphosate levels. Uh, people that um, aren't eating um, organic nuts, we're, we're seeing some high fumigant levels from the, they fumigate the nuts. To, and to what's that? It. What's that? Um, it's the, what we test for is a, it's a propylene oxide. Uh, so it's a derivative of one of the, the fumigants. So 
I think it can be so overwhelming when I start talking about this. It's like, oh my God, what do I eat? What do I drink? What's going on in my house? And and so we need to, um, we actually have a handout, anship MD slash toxins. So you can just do a little bit at a time, right? So you can start to think about what are you using to clean your house? You can start to think about um, which foods are most important to buy organic. So we, we piece it out rather than, and dumping it all at once. But even, you know, I have so many people that are have increased fish in their diet because they're being told that that's healthy. And then their heavy metals are for both mercury and um, aluminum, sometimes arsenic are going sky high. And those are so neurotoxic among other effects. And it really, I know, you know, a lot of your focus with your um, audiences online when we get uh, these toxins accumulating in our body, it suppresses our immune system. So our immune system doesn't do as well at keeping the organisms that it, you know, could just be little bystanders. Um, they can have a party. Right, right. How common is the mold component? Ah. <laughs> <laughs> ah, you want me to look at your throat? Open up. Ah. <laughs> um, mold is one of the epidemics that we're facing in the United States and I think other countries as well with the with the poor building quality that um, has been going on really I think since the 70s instead of it being more like a craftsmanship if you look back to the older homes a lot of them are built with such precision and care um, and then the effort to build these tight homes so that they're energy efficient when you lock in the moisture, uh, it, a little problem can become a big problem because we really have to keep the humidity low in our homes or any, um, any type of old leak or you know, sometimes people will just get it in like between the layers of their mattresses if the humidity is running high. Yeah, people can get those little uh, meters uh, they're not very expensive and, you know, you okay. just obviously $10 make dollars. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And they can actually see the humidity level. And some people are, you know, we've had trouble where in the winter time, the heat's on, but if I have the shades down behind it, it gets moist. The and it's like, well, that can't. The temper gradient, that is not good. Right. So yeah. really like either if you can putting in an additional uh, whole house dehumidifier or if not, at least running uh, one of the standing dehumidifiers in areas where you're uh, cooking or bathing to keep yeah. the humidity less than 50% will really help. And then one of the other big things is if you've had a water leak, you've got to get the drywall dried within 24 to 48 hours. Or in most places in the country, there's a high probability of having some mold grow. Yeah. So mold makes multiple kinds of toxins. It's um, mycotoxins and NVOCs. NVOCs you can smell often. So that that's that, that musty smell that people like when you open the door to um, you know a hotel room and you're like, mm, don't not go good. in there, right? Yeah, don't <laughs> right. go in there. Shut the door and ask for another room. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, but the mycotoxins don't have an odor. So a lot of times people think, oh, you know, I don't have any of my allergy system symptoms. I can't smell it, so it's not there. But that's not true. If, um, if you've had any kind of water intrusion that you know of, uh, it's probably a good idea to prioritize getting that taken care of because the, um, the mold toxins increase the risk for cancer, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, all kinds of things that we want to get ahead of. We're, we don't want to wait till we have those symptoms and then try to go back and figure out what it is. So people, when they come and they have a certain set of symptoms, are you kind of going down that path? Hmm. I got to look at the environment first, you know, and then I have to look at, uh, you know, where are they working? Where do they go on the weekends? You have to ask all those questions, right? Because the history may give you big clues to what's going on. Huge clues. Um, down to, you know, what are people's hobbies? Uh, one of the biggest risk of hobbies that I've found is painters, the artists. They, you know, the materials that they use in their work, they're, a lot of times they're kinesthetic and they're handling them. So it's going through their skin and then they're breathing them. And um, it can be really devastating once people hit that tipping point of where their bodies are 
um, not able to compensate for that anymore. I'm thinking right now, people who uh, hand make jewelry. I, I've had several jewelers. Mm -hmm. Wow. Wow. Yeah. There's a lot to think about. There's a, there is a lot to think about. But, you know, we, we, we aren't learning more about our food and we're learning more about exposures to certain things. Um, we're really, you know, there's, there's only so much people can do. Do you focus mainly on the food source and where it's coming from as, as a really good entrance point to teach your patients? That is a great entrance point. And there's so much we can do with food to help our bodies to detoxify. So, you know, eating a highly plant-based diet, I'm not saying vegetarian, but eating lots of cruciferous vegetables, the broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, kale, Brussels sprouts, bok choy, <laughs> all of those really make a huge difference in what our bodies can exit out. And then the onions and garlic and curcumin and um, other spices are also super, super helpful. And then that my favorite fruit would be some berries because of the phytonutrients that make them brightly colored. And then just start with where the obvious things are for you that you can avoid. So you're really trying to promote the system to detoxify. Really, truly, no matter what it is that they have, people's systems can get all glucked up. So doing all those, you know, bits of fruit and all those vegetables do help. Is it, is it helping simply because it's grabbing it out of the gut because of the high fiber? Or is there another component that helps through the liver? Good question. So fiber good is question. definitely <laughs> helpful. Yes. But the, some of the nutrients in those cruciferous vegetables actually help phase two of detoxification so it can help to grab it and then get it to exit out through the kidneys or through the digestive tract. So yeah. if you're cooking it, is there a particular way uh, that doesn't ruin those qualities? Because I'm always thinking about that. You know, I love my veggies roasted with some olive oil and uh, I try not to make them mushy, but is there certain ways that, you know, really don't do that because you're not getting the benefit you need? Don't char them. Like grilling them is not a good idea because the char is counterproductive. Other than that, my view on it is um, eat them the way you like them the best, unless they're drenched in cheese and butter. <laughs> <laughs> but because getting well, how them else in... you're going to get your butter in, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, um, I think roasted is great. Um, I, I there are actually people that study this. Like, what's the optimal amount of um, cooking for broccoli and it's like lightly steaming it for nine seconds or something. I don't even remember exactly, but it's hardly cooking it. It's just barely like getting those um, plant cells activated, but just getting it in makes a huge difference. And you really do want to try to get a cup to three cups a day. You, if you haven't been eating any of them, you might have to go gradually and really cook them well, like make a pureed soup or something. I, I had a big pot of um, pureed broccoli soup this week that I ate for lunch that was so delicious. I could eat it every meal. <laughs> so good. Oh, and then you weren't friendly with all your patients and you weren't a big hit in the office? <laughs> well, if you just started doing that, that's my butt, my gut's used to it. So, so I was, yeah, yeah. It's okay. <laughs> you were okay. You could handle that. Yeah. People don't realize when they change their diet, because I had somebody uh, that uh, actually uh, takes care of me in my orthodontist's office and she doesn't want people to know that we have that outside relationship so she's leaning over me and she says look at my stomach and I'm like she goes look at how bloated I am I go yeah because we're you know kind of cleaning things up there and you're going to get that for a little while until you start processing I said if it's too bad cut back on what you're you know, eating in terms of your veggies or, you know, taking your probiotics or whatnot and just kind of go slower. But it's, it's important. It, it really is. And it is, it is hard and it's super expensive, uh, as you said, you know, and I, I don't think organic meats, you know, grass fed meats, et cetera, uh, maybe some eggs do go on sale, but the vast majority of time, it's kind of a limited supply and you, I, I do know people who say, search for a farmer, know your farmer, 
And, you know, if you're going to eat your chicken or your meat and you know your farmer and you know what they have in their fields, you're probably better off. And certainly if you're, some people say they'll take their neighborhood, you know, I'm kind of getting grossed out by talking about this, but they go, they go to their farmer and they share, you know, this particular type of meat amongst the neighbors they all pitch in and they're you know you can freeze it and and have it that way so that's you know you got to be creative in order to save money yeah that reminds me of um, my uh, both of my parents grew up on farms and so when i was a kid at week i grew up in lexington kentucky and my grandparents were in iowa I, a couple of times we got like a quarter of a cow <laughs> and somehow i guess put it in ice checks and uh, chess and drove it back to, to home because it was just the best way to get the least expensive but tastiest meat to do it that way. So, <laughs> right, right. Over. You know, there, I'm, I'm assuming if you research enough, you probably could find a butcher, whatnot, that, that does ship things out. So, I, I don't have that resource. I guess I need to look at that. But you know what? There I is want? a company called is? Butcher, butcher Block. Um, that has the healthier, I think there's a link to that under resources on my website. Um, and then wellness meats is also another one that will perfect healthy meats. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. Good. Good to know. Good to know. And just say your website again, in case somebody missed it the first time. It's annshippymd.com. A-N-N-S-H-I-P-P-Y.com. Got it. Got it. You know, let's get into a little bit about women's health. Uh, you know, everybody knows that I practice gynecology and obstetrics for a long, long time. And I really do wish that I had known as much as I know now to really help people. I mean, we did a lot of testing. We looked for uh, autoimmune markers and things, especially when people were having, uh, you know, frequent miscarriage. But you know what? We never knew to look at the environment. So do you have women coming to you prenatally to say, how do I get healthy? Do you have women coming to you, uh, you know, to manage issues before pregnancy? Tell, tell us more about that. Uh, so <laughs> that was a I lot love, of questions. No, no, all no. Rolled in one. I just, I just feel, I just get a little emotional because one of oh. my favorite things to do is to help both men and women if I can get to them about six to nine months before they're even thinking about getting pregnant and help both of them get their bodies optimized. Because with this field of epigenetics, where um, we can see that it's not just your genes, it's how your genes are behaving that influence how the person does. So if we can help men to clean up their bodies, then the genes that they pass on are um, expressed bit better in the baby and then the same thing for the mom and also then helping her to get her toxin levels down so that and that's actually great for the the father as well but helping the mom get her toxins down so she's not passing them on both uh, epigenetically as well as uh, through the, the placenta um, and then women get so depleted like the baby just sucks the resources that it needs. And so women really, really need to have their nutrients built up optimally so that they can stay healthy through the pregnancy and then through nursing. And then another stage that I really love to, to help women is after pregnancy, like, okay, what, what did you have sucked out of you that we need to do extra to replete? Magnesium is always low. Like it's low in most patients, but then um, postpartum. Oh my gosh. It takes a lot of magnesium to grow a baby. <laughs> yeah. And your B vitamins. And, you know, one time I met Dr. Lee Cowden at a conference, I was okay. introduced to him and I shook his hand and he goes, Ooh, how much magnesium do you take? And I go, at that point, I really didn't know. And he goes, obviously not enough. Your hands are freezing. <laughs> He's a character. <laughs> He's a tall character, you know, and I'm, you know, just a little over a couple inches over five feet. So I had to really strain my neck to, to look at him. But, but, in, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it was a nice little thing for me to know. Um, 
So, so you would recommend like a nutritional profile, vitamins, minerals, et cetera, either before conceiving or after conceiving, depending on when they come to you? Yes. Yes. And depending on how, you know, what people's resources are, how much time and energy they have, because sometimes it's alarming. Like if we do the toxin profile and it comes back and there's a lot of mercury or uh, pesticides or plastics or whatever, I put the brakes on. So even if they're 40 and they're like, oh my gosh, I got to have this baby now. Um, I'm like, well, I think you'll, you'll do better. The baby will do better if we take three to nine months and really get these toxins out of your system. So what's your protocol for removing um, some of these toxins? So I really customize it for the individual person, but we do have a very in-depth cleanse that's going to be coming out uh, early November that will take people through. It's there. It's, you know, getting, making sure that the my, microbiome is healthy, uh, supporting phase one and phase two pathways, making sure the gallbladder is working. So it's very, very comprehensive. Um, you know, it, uh, <laughs> it's, a, it's a lot. One of my favorite things though is liposomal glutathione because I see so many people that are deficient and glutathione and that's the best way to build it up and that's one of the main ways that we clear mold toxins pesticides and heavy metals out of our bodies so if people are going to do something light from the standpoint of detoxification i would start with eating the really um plant-based diet with the adequate amounts of protein thrown in and then do magnesium <laughs> b vitamins and and glutathione as right. a start as a start yeah and again um i want to emphasize it's it's a liposomal version because of the molecular structure correct right if you take other forms of glutathione it's probably just going to get digested and to the components of it and not actually raise intracellular glutathione which is really where we need it so when you take it in a liposomal form it goes right where it needs to go uh, in without getting digested Right. A lot of people don't understand that the best way to test for your nutrient resources are within the cells. You know, if it's just flying around in your bloodstream, that's not telling us what's inside the cell. And if you've got cells that aren't functioning optimally, their, um, their membranes are stiffened and, you know, et cetera, you know, these membranes are made out of fat. So you really want to help them. You know, do you focus a bit on uh, really good, clean fish oils and the additional omegas and ALA, alpha lipoic acid? Yes, and definitely uh, getting cell membranes healthy so all the little chemical messengers in the body can get received appropriately. That's a really important piece of it, as well as helping the mitochondria to function optimally. A lot of us, our mitochondria have gotten really sluggish so they're not making the energy that our cells need to be able to do all their daily jobs and um so i like to really focus on those two as well and so how do you do that what's what's your goal with patients what what should they do to improve those functions so a lot of times it's uh a detoxifying itself so not having the toxins uh interfering with the, the mitochondrial function but then things that repel here, the uh, mitochondrial membrane like phosphatidylcholine and then uh, CoQ10 and other things that support the electron transport chain. Right. Um, so it's there's a lot so of really good. Complicated. <laughs> it's so complicated. And, you know, especially when you look at genetics and how the pathways connect and then people who do well in one phase or one area of a set of, of genes that could impact another area and so that in and of itself is that's a specialty in and of itself you know being able to do that um what about mold in food mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, mold in food is a big issue so um you know, and there are places in the world where it's it's a a huge, huge problem. Like in Africa, um, there are a lot of cancer deaths every year from having very moldy food. But um, and I think it's it's a piece of the puzzle here, and it's something that we can all do. 
after sitting next to somebody who works for one of the big food companies and their quality control a few years ago, I was asking her some of these questions because she got, she got a window into, you know, what's the real data on some of this. And I, I would never eat corn again. Mm. Like, because mm -mm. it's pretty much all moldy. And uh, a lot of the companies making products, this particular company uh, is a family run company and uh, they just had very high standards. So I'm like, well, what if you, what if you guys reject this corn? Where does it go? And just, just to another um, food company or this company also makes a lot of animal products and they make sure that they have very high standards for the animal food as well. And so they just send it to another, another one. So grains in general tend to be moldy. Um, so wheat, barley, rice, felt, kamut, all of those. If you think about it, they're, you know, the way that they're stored and harvested and all of that, it's just, there's going to be some moisture in there. Mold is ubiquitous in our environment and it'll start to mold and break down. And we don't really have a great way to test it in and it's not monitored very well. So the, the corn, other grains, coffee. Yes. Yes. So, coffee's really rough. I would not drink coffee if it's not from Bulletproof or yeah. there's another one. But there is another one that Dr. Jill Carnahan said once. And I, I think it's called purity. It's purity. Yeah. It was a P one. I kept looking mm -hmm. up Puritan. But Bulletproof one. is everywhere now. It's in, yeah. I think it's even in Target. So it's easy to get. You don't have to, you know, track it down. And, right. And so right. That's the one I like. Yeah. Um, and then, and then peanuts. Yeah. I love peanuts, but I'll, I eat them like once a year. <laughs> I know. I, okay. I know these are moldy because yeah. they just aren't ever not. And then yeah. other nuts, you know, if you look at them, like the cashews and their dark spots, don't eat them. Oh, it's the dark spots we have to look well, for. It can be white as well. Um, yeah. So even apples, you know, that white uh, stuff that's in the center of apples or you know, the dark stuff along the core. That's, that's mold as well. So just inspect your food the best that you can. Right, right. Those are, the big hitters really are the grains and the peanuts and the coffee. Oh, You know what? It was funny because my husband, um, through work, got about a three or five pound bag of pistachios. Now that is my weakness. Well, I must have ate the majority of the bag. And then I went and got my mold test and... I believe it was extremely high in okra toxins. And it probably came from all of those pistachios I ate. Yes. Well, it'd be really interesting to, you know, do some glutathione and wait a little bit and retest it just to make sure. Yeah, you know, again, I'm in the same I'm in the same boat as the majority of people. You know, mold testing is absolutely never covered by an insurance company. And, you know, are you gonna spend the two ninety nine or are you just gonna go on the way you feel? Right? I'm waiting. Right. Yes. No. Well, <laughs> I'm better off the test, right? <laughs> Especially once it's been high, you can't ignore it. You've got to go test it again. And if it's not down, then you've got to figure out where it's coming from because ocrotoxin is such a major carcinogen. Oh, it is. Um, yeah. We got to, we got to, we got to, we really have to prioritize and our health is really. Now, can mold impact reproduction? Absolutely. It's, it's alarming, actually. It can inc increase the worst, uh, risk for birth defects. Um, it can increase the risk for uh, uh, the baby not growing so small intrauterine growth. Um, and there's also links with um, mold and autism. So I think um, a lot of times some of the mycotoxins are getting passed along to the fetus. Oh. That's, that's I, tough. That's, that is, that's really, that's really, it's, it is alarming because if you look at the fertility rate, it has dropped. Um, men's uh, testosterone levels have dropped. Um, I was at Bob Miller's conference and um, he was, this was kind of off the cuff and he was talking about it. And then he mentioned um, alligator penises are becoming smaller. And then he paused. It was a perfect time to pause. He goes, I wonder whose job that is. <laughs> uh, we, well, there's, I, we also just posted a, a video that I got to interview um, the, one of the lead researchers on investigating glyphosate. 
And um, so they're doing crowdfunding research because no, none of the governments are paying for it and the, the government isn't requiring Monsanto to do it, right? So they're doing crowdfunding. So there's a video on my social on glyphosate and it also looks at the reproductive impacts of this uh, ubiquitous pesticide. Now, um, where do you store this mold in your body? Mm, it really depends on the person. So there are some people just with environmental toxins in general that can make these little pockets of fat called lipomas and Ooh. stick it away uh, more safely. And then um, everybody else, it kind of depends on your weight, weak, where your weak link is. So it can really build up in the liver, the kidneys, uh, the brain. A lot of my patients with um, mold um, impact feel that like their brain's heavy or they're foggy or they can't make decisions as well. They're, you know, their executive function to even sort through information and decide is impacted as well as their mood. Um, I see OCD and depression, anxiety. It's a, a major impact for a lot of people's brains. And then sometimes it'll just show up as an autoimmune disorder or a cancer. So um, I think some people are actually putting it in their adipose tissue and can actually, some people, instead of being able to sock it away in a lipoma, just start gaining weight for no reason. Their diet's the same, they're exercising the same, and they're like, oh my God, where, where is this body coming from? But it's the body often trying to take the environmental toxins and protect the brain and the heart and the other vital organs. When I see people with thyroid disorders, I think environmental toxicity very quickly because I, the thyroid's kind of like the canary in the body for a lot of people. So if you start having a thyroid issue, you gotta think, you gotta ask your healthcare provider to dig a little deeper as to why your thyroid is either overactive or underactive. Right, and people don't realize that it's not necessarily an entire flood that causes this. It, it can be these little leaks that go on for a while, especially in older homes. You have to be really, really careful. And it may be worth the money spent that, especially if you're going into a new home or buying a new home or, whatever, getting some type of environmental um, testing. Definitely do not go into a new place without testing it because um, so often these issues are hidden. Um, I would say at least 50% of the time with my patients, they had no known leaks or floods or anything. And it's just, and even in newer homes, it's, uh, it's that art of construction where they didn't do the flashings on the window or the chimney, right? Or they didn't caulk the vent from the bathroom properly. And um, the little leaks that can happen behind a refrigerator or dishwasher, it, just every area that there's opportunity for water to come into the home or uh, leak out of one of the water sources or even the condensation like you were talking about. Mm. Like the condensation in the air conditioning systems is a really big issue in a lot of areas. A lot of people worry about the mold that can um, occur in your bathroom, say around your shower or your shower door, and it's pink. What kind of mold is pink? So this is one of the things that kind of drives me crazy when somebody comes in and says, oh, yeah, that's nothing. Because mold can change colors depending on how, where it's growing, what, what it's growing on and what other species are in its mix. And so to say, oh, that's not mold, you cannot tell unless you test it. Somebody's got to look at it under a microscope or do the DNA probe or check for the mycotoxins to really know. So I've seen both. You know, I've seen people whose bathroom mold is just a nuisance. And then I've seen it where it's stachybotrys, the, you know, the black mold that yeah. makes the trichothecenes that are pretty um, big deals. Why do some people just not get sick and they're exposed to mold? Oh, I love that question. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just like any other toxin. There's so much misinformation about this out there. So with enough exposure to mycotoxins, anybody can get sick. But for a lot of us, there are these thresholds. So 
for me, when I got sick from all, we didn't even talk about my mold story, but I, you know, I, I probably had a, I still had a bunch of uh, heavy metals in my body from the mercury fillings and eating tuna fish every day for years. And then I had my <laughs> chemical engineering exposures and my, you know, being in the anatomy lab with the formaldehyde and all those things where there are some residuals left behind. And then just the not knowing from the day to day. So I had lots of opportunities for exposure. And then it turns out that my detoxification genes are a little sluggish, so I don't zip stuff out as well as a lot of people. And um, and then uh, had a big exposure. I had something going on in my home and in my office. And at that point in time, that was what, um, eight or nine years ago, I didn't understand what I needed to do, be doing on a day-to-day, week-to-week basis to really keep some reserve in my barrel, right? So it's so so individual on who's going to get sick first, but everybody can be affected. And I've had so many um, either children or spouses that didn't think that they were being affected, but it's like being the frog in the pot. And then when they either get the house cleaned or they get into a, um, a clean environment, they're, they're like, oh, I actually have a better mood and a longer fuse that things don't set me off this skin condition that I had is clearing up and I have more energy. Whereas they just kind of thought, Oh, well, that's just cause I'm aging. <laughs> yeah. Right. Well, we all are aging, but certainly we don't want to get there too fast. You know, people often ask, um, uh, different set of genes. And we know the MTHFR has a lot to do with methylation process. Uh, what, set of genes really uh, do people need to look at when, it ca- when they're talking about detoxification? Almost every person that I've uh, taken care of that was very impacted by mold has had some issues with how well they methylate. So that's foundational. Pretty much everybody that comes to see me gets that looked at. And then I like to look at the phase one and phase two detoxification genes. Uh, I see some ongoing things there as well and who is most susceptible um, and then, um, I do sometimes look at some of the immune system genes, the HLA genes, but I haven't really found that it changes the way that I treat people. Whereas when I look at the methylation genes and the detoxification genes, it really helps me to guide them on both how to get better as well as how to get that reserve in their barrel so that they don't get slammed. Um, right. We do run on empty an awful lot. We don't have, right? We're, we're busy and we're stressed and it, people just don't realize the impact um, of our lifestyle right now. Well, and that's such a great point because I found that one of the biggest change, things that change our threshold on how susceptible our body is, is stress. So I just gave a TEDx talk that's not out yet on how we can teach our genes how to behave. (laughs) Oh, I can't wait. I can't wait. Have the excuse to sit and read articles for weekends on end so that I had every I dotted and T crossed. So the thing that's really amazing is the impact of meditation. You know, we we used to just think, oh, that's, (laughs) you know, that's just for the woo-woo people out there. I've always been kind of woo-woo though. (laughs) I've studied many, many uh, people, People are unsure what that term really means. They think it's a Buddhist in a temple and it's hours on end. And they don't realize that just stopping and being in the moment and using your senses and taking some breathing relaxation, you know, you're, you're settling down that vagus nerve. You're, you're going from that fight or flight over to the rest and digest. And it doesn't, it doesn't have to be a long time. It, it, it really takes well, maybe a couple minutes. It's the ideal is to do 12 minutes at least once a day based on all the research that I put together. But even five minutes makes a difference. And really all you have to do is focus on your breathing. I love that box breathing where you breathe in for five counts, hold for five out for five, hold for five, because you can do that even waiting in the grocery store line. Or- well, sometimes you have to. Do you ever get behind somebody that, you know, nowadays pay- they shouldn't be paying with a check? I mean, who pays with a check anymore, <laughs> right? Fun. And you're like, oh my God. And then of course, then you start revving up and you're getting upset. And 
I'm really calm. I have to say I'm really calm, but I, I've seen people like start sighing and, and they're so mad. I mean, really, it's okay. <laughs> So if you, and if you meditate every day, you're less likely to even feel that frustration of things that you can't control. <laughs> What's, when, when do you, when do you find time to do that? Like give us some hope and inspiration. So I like to do it first thing in the morning, get up, go to the bathroom, meditate, because if I wait till later in the day, other priorities seem more important. So yeah, some days I only take five minutes, but many mornings I actually can find 20 minutes. and. There's no such thing as a bad meditation. Even if you think, oh my God, I just thought about my to-do list for the day or that conversation I had last night, the intention of meditating and coming back to your breathing or some word that really inspires you, it's your body's getting the signal that it can go into repair mode and it can go into relaxation mode rather than just the run, run, run. And that the epigenetic part I love about it is that it actually lengthens our telomeres. Mm. So those are the um, little strands that hold our DNA in place and shorten as we age. So it's kind of like reversing aging, right? To be able to lengthen our telomeres. And then it increases the, or decreases the expression of some really important inflammatory genes. And then it changes how our bodies physiologically respond to stress. So it's just, that's one of the easiest things that we can do to help our bodies have more reserves. So, you know, two other things that really impact our health, and we always are looking for better ways to encourage our, our people, um, is sleep. Sleep is so critical, but, you know, sometimes the person does everything in their power in terms of, you know, avoiding, you know, the blue light with the TV screen and the computer and the phone and then removing the phone from their room and, you know, spending time getting ready to fall asleep and all those kind of things. Is, do you have any other tricks for people to help them sleep? Uh, there are some supplements that I really find helpful, often really helpful. Um, the, but the, some of the People that actually have the worst sleep problems, what we find is environmental toxins are at the root of it. It's disrupting their neurotransmitters. So, the, so there are some Band-Aids that we can find often. And the total correction is probably getting back to, you know, are there nutrients you're depleted in? Are there environmental toxins that are impacting your neurotransmitters and how your brain is working? That's really interesting. That is a solid entrance point, you know, that's really good. What about getting people moving so that they're, you know, really pumping their heart and moving them, their lymphatic system? How do you, how do you encourage someone that is really important to? Oh move? my gosh. Yeah. And that's a whole other thing. There's a lot of epigenetic data around exercise. So it changes what our genes do for 24 to 48 hours. So if you could do 20 minutes, at least every other day, it, it doesn't, you don't have to go to the gym for an hour. You don't have to train for a marathon. In fact, that's probably not good for you to do triathlons and marathons because uh, it's too much stress on the body. So just move with walking or something that you enjoy. Even stretching can make a difference. Um, there's all kinds of things that you can do. It, the key thing is find something that you will actually do. And, and, and stick get, with it, right? Um, Tell us about your books. I know that you have two and one coming. Yes. So the one that's coming, it'll be probably another year before it's fully out. Um, that one is on this whole the topic that I'm loving on epigenetics. And then um, I have one on mold, like just it's a mold workbook. Here's how you set through, test it yourself, the environment. Here are the, talk, the supplements I think are most important and the, um, the best diet to follow. And then the other one's my paleo diet uh, that I find the best results with um, getting inflammation down in the body and, and feeling the best. Well, that's good. That's good. You know, we, we really do rely on, um, on you people, I'll put you all in a group that have the experience, the exposure, the ability to look into all of this research 
and to kind of formulate a plan and put it together. So I really, I give you kudos and I really thank you for the things that you're doing uh, alongside of having a practice and children and, you know, other obligations and, you know, the whole family and, you know, you, you seem to, um, you seem to be holding it together really well. <laughs> I get so much joy from getting to do what I do that I, I'm just so lucky to get to use my gifts and um, combine with my heart. I'm just loving to help people. And um, I just inspired every day to look for ways that I can make a difference for, for more people. So I'm a girl with 26 years of education that never changed, uh, raised her hand in class and hated to be called on. And now, <laughs> I know, now I'm having so much fun stepping up. I, I'll, I'll tell you another story. I got on a huge stage this last weekend um, with some of the most prominent people in the world talking about environmental toxicity. And if you had told me that I would have done that five years ago, I would have said, oh, no, that's not me. But I'm, it, it, this is such an important topic and people need to know it. We've got to start changing the way that, that our, we farm, the way we package our food and grow our food, the way we build buildings. Uh, we spend $3.3 trillion in the United States alone on healthcare, and 90% of that is on chronic diseases that could have been prevented. Right. They, uh, I read some statistics that by 2023, if we don't get moving and change this, our healthcare system will not be able to handle the amount of chronicity. And it's creeping into the children. We have children with obesity, with diabetes, with high blood pressure. Where did that come from? You know, look at look at back if you if you've ever seen any old town pictures, like if you have a historic area and you look at these old like black and whites or they're really like brown and white, there was no obesity back then. The biggest risk for diabetes and obesity is a buildup of environmental toxins. That's crazy. Mm -hmm. That is crazy. And you know, people just really need to and I will too, um, fork it over and, and, you know, do your program, do your program and, um, really get, get the before and after shot because that's the, and really understand where it came from. I think it's fine, you know, learning about it, getting your body to detoxify, but if you don't know where the source was, or you're really not into investigating you really should do that. One of the things that I like to do sometimes is I love to go to estate sales and it's fun poking around a house. My husband loves to do that. But one of the things that I want to remind people is do not ever buy anything that has material on it from an old home or whatnot. And I'm talking books, I'm talking rugs or furniture, never a mattress. Do you agree with that? I do. <laughs> it's too bad, it's, though. I know there's I know. some really neat things. Well, I mean, I think some of these things, like the wood and things, you can, uh, you can restore them. You can take all the fabric off and then put on fresh, which you might want to do anyway. The books, like the books, I love books, and I, there may be some way to restore books, but I haven't found it. And after I went through my big, my big toxic mold thing, I had to get rid of my library because. Every time I tried to clean it, when I take it out of the uh, take the books out of the Ziploc bags, I could actually feel it and smell it. So. You can, you can. It's crazy. Have we have we forgotten anything? We had a lot. We really did a full okay. circle. We did. So the message that I want to leave your audience with is to really believe in your body. When your body has what it needs to run the biochemistry biochemistry and physiology from a nutritional standpoint and it's not being overwhelmed by stress and environmental toxins you really can feel better as you age rather than feeling that decline so don't settle for anything less I think that's really important and to really value your health because if you're not healthy you're not going to enjoy your life you're not going to be the best person you can be so I think that's really important. I want to thank you, Dr. Shippey. This has been, this has been really enlightening. And I, I see there is, and I really want people to know there's a light at the end of the tunnel. There is hope for people. They just need to find that right practitioner to work with. And if you're not finding that right practitioner, you need to move on. 
Exactly. It's, it's unfortunate. Yeah. There are people that don't understand nor do they want to take part in this. And, you know, part of it is the fact that a lot of primary care or, you know, some of these specialists uh, have kind of put their blinders on and they know they have a specific amount of time they can spend with a patient. And if they, if they, you know, diverge, move over, try to think of other things with these people, it's awful. I, I had a patient who told me that uh, her primary care was upset that I ran a bunch of regular labs and that I took money off the top of what he'd get paid by the insurance company and basically said to her, if you're going to continue working with Cindy Kennedy, then you'll need to find a new primary care doctor. I was devastated. I was like, you know, I'm not practicing witchcraft. I, you know, this is a functional approach to helping people either be healthy, stay healthy, or get healthy. And what more could you want for your patient? Because if I can get some of your people healthy, they're not going to be in your office all the time. Mm -hmm. Isn't that good? It's, a, it's yeah, it, and it's it's appalling. I like we really and we're we need we have to shift our model from sick care to to prevention and well care. Right, right. So talk so about much, it, people out there. Talk about it. So much pain and suffering could be Thank avoided. This. Thank you. I, I agree wholeheartedly. Well, everybody, you have just listened to Dr. Ann Shippey, and uh, she has a practice in Texas. You can look her up on the internet, and then there'll be her website. On, um, on her bio information. I want to thank everybody for listening. I encourage you to come back. I encourage you to look at uh, livingwithlime.us and pursuewellness.us. Let us know if we can help you at all. Until we meet again, everyone, take good care.